And there are two ways for each of us to be able to defeat the devil as well. The first is to do what Jesus did every single time he was tempted, to properly quote and to properly apply scripture to the situation. But you can only do this if, if you know your Bible. If you don't know your Bible, you cannot understand what the devil is doing in your life. And I'm talking about on any level, going through a red light. It doesn't matter what the situation is. If you are not aware of what God intends for you, no matter how small the issue, you will fail. You have to know your Bible for every single issue. And that's why I love when people come to sermons. I love when people go to Bible studies because they are learning how to defend themselves against what is a real evil entity in the universe today, which is the devil, all right? If you don't know your Bible, you are setting yourself up for destruction. That's all there is to it. But even if you are well armed, it doesn't take care of the other problem that we already face. As I said, we've already sinned. We've already failed the test. How can we do the will of God and abide forever? The answer is Jesus. This is the work of God that you believe in him whom you sent. This is the Christmas story, by the way. This is God coming down. He's already seen us screw up his creation. We've turned our back on him, we've sinned against him, and we've violated every possible precept that we can every time that we get the chance to do it. And yet, despite that, he comes down out of eternity and he unites with human flesh. And he becomes this little helpless baby in a manger that we're gonna celebrate in the next seven days. This little baby that created the universe is laying there breathing the air that he created and he is whining to a mother that he created before eternity even existed or before the universe even existed. Mary was already in the mind of God and yet he came down and he became a part of her. And then he was born into this little stall, this little stable in this place where the lambs and the cows go to get a lapping of water. And he's laying there helpless, demonstrating that he is willing to do something that is the most incredible thing in the world that he would come and live this life that you and I couldn't live. And he went through every single temptation, every single trial, every single problem that we have ever faced, he went through as well. And guess what? He didn't have air conditioning. He didn't have a car to get to work. He didn't have any of the conveniences that we do today. He lived, she can tell you, he can tell you, it is very hot in Israel. He lived in the heat, he lived in the sweat, he lived with flies around him. And all of the trouble that you and I face in our lives, this is what Jesus Christ went through. And when he came to the end of his life, he still hadn't sinned, and he could have just said, well, I'm done with this. Instead, he gave his life up on a cross to prove that he had satisfied the demands of the law, which he had written. So it's not too burdensome for anybody, but we still fail at it. But he satisfied that, and then he says, all I want you to do is for you to put your trust in what I have done. I created you, I know what's best for you, and I know that you're gonna screw it up on your own, and you cannot work your way back to me. It's not gonna happen. So he lived that life that we can't live. He gave his life up in exchange for ours. God poured out his wrath on him, and now we have a choice. Call on the name of Jesus Christ, or be eternally separated from God. And it all goes back to the verses we're evaluating today, because we initiated the turning away, not God. He has been there with us ever since, working out his plan of redemption in human history. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning at shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God.